Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is adverse effects of blood transfusion. In this video, we will learn about the definition of transfusion reaction and the various adverse effects associated with blood transfusion that will include immediate adverse effects as well as delayed adverse effects of blood transfusion. Also, towards the end of today's video, we will also talk briefly about complications associated with massive blood transfusion. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. So first we will talk about some introductory points regarding blood transfusion. Now always remember blood transfusion is a life-saving procedure. However, it should be considered only when there are no alternative means to treat the condition. For example, if we can treat the patient by infusion of intravenous fluids or by providing some specific treatment of anemia, then those treatment options should be considered first before thinking about blood transfusion as a treatment option. Even with best blood banking standards, complications can occur. That's why risks and benefits of blood transfusion should be assessed before considering blood transfusion. So now that we have talked about some introductory points regarding blood transfusion, now we are ready to talk about blood transfusion reaction. So what do we mean by blood transfusion reaction or how can we define blood transfusion reaction? It can be defined as any untoward reaction that occurs as a consequence of infusion of blood or blood cell therapy products. Okay, so I am repeating the definition again for my students. Blood transfusion reaction can be defined as any untoward, that means unwanted, reaction that occurs as a consequence of infusion of blood or blood cell therapy products. As you can see, we can classify adverse effects of blood transfusion under two broad headings, immediate adverse effects and delayed adverse effects. Immediate adverse effects occur within 24 hours of blood transfusion and delayed adverse effects occur after 24 hours of blood transfusion. Now this slide is very important for your examination. The examiner may ask you to classify immediate adverse effects of blood transfusion and we can classify them in two broad headings, immunological and non-immunological immediate adverse effects. So what are the immunological immediate adverse effects? They will include febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions, hemolytic transfusion reactions, allergic reactions, anaphylactic reactions, and also transfusion-associated lung injury, which is also referred as TRALI. Among the non-immunological immediate adverse effects, there are circulatory overload, bacterial contamination of donor blood unit, etc. Now, this slide is also important. Here we can see the delayed adverse effects of blood transfusion. Among the delayed immunological adverse effects, there are hemolytic transfusion reactions, post-transfusion purpura, graft-versus-host disease. Among the non-immunological delayed adverse effects, there are transmission of infectious organism, iron overload, etc. So we can see that hemolytic transfusion reaction can happen both within and after 24 hours. 
So now that we have classified adverse effects of blood transfusion, now let's talk about the various complications one by one. So first we will talk about the immediate complications and the first one that we will talk about is febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. It is common in recipients of multiple transfusion and also in women who had multiple pregnancies. Why? Because of previous sensitization. So what are the clinical features of febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction? There will be fever that is obvious, chills, flushing, anxiety, tachycardia, headache and itching. And these reactions will begin 30 to 60 minutes after the start of transfusion. So what is the pathogenesis of this type of transfusion reaction? Always remember that the main reason is release of cytokines from leukocytes or white blood cells during storage of blood. And another mechanism is reaction of recipients allo antibodies with transfused white blood cells and due to such reaction there will be liberation of pyrogens that will result in fever. Now I have an entire video on cytokines so you can watch that video after finishing this video to know more about cytokines. How can we diagnose such reaction? It is based on diagnosis of exclusion. So here we have to exclude other causes of fever such as hemolytic transfusion reaction, bacterial contamination of donor blood unit and transfusion associated lung injury. How can we manage such reaction? We have to stop the transfusion and we have to do some workup for excluding other causes of fever. We have to administer antipyretics either orally or parrectal and we have to administer antihistaminic either intramuscularly or intravenously. How can we prevent febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction? We have to slow the rate of transfusion. For example, it may take up to four hours to transfuse one unit of whole blood in certain cases where there is history of febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction in previous blood transfusion. We have to administer antipyretics before starting transfusion and transfusion of leukocyte depleted blood is also helpful. The next complication that we will talk about is hemolytic transfusion reaction. How can we define this? It can be defined as the occurrence of signs of red cell destruction following transfusion. The most obvious of these signs being hemoglobinuria that is presence of hemoglobin in the urine and jaundice. Now hemolytic transfusion reaction occurs due to transfusion of incompatible red blood cells. Most common cause is ABO incompatibility and it is mediated by immunoglobulin M anti A or anti B antibodies. Mismatched ABO blood transfusion usually occurs due to clerical errors. And here we can see the causes. It can happen due to incorrect identification of recipient during sample collection or during transfusion. It can happen due to incorrect labeling of sample tubes or due to incorrect filling of request form. So that's why we have to be very careful during the blood transfusion procedure so that such clerical errors are avoided. Now in your textbook you will see this term pseudohemolytic type of reaction and some examiners are very fond of asking what are the causes of pseudohemolytic type of reaction. Now always remember this type of reaction is not happening 
due to ABO incompatibility. It is happening due to these following causes. They will include transfusion of improperly stored blood, transfusion of blood that was stored for too long, and transfusion of blood that is already hemolyzed. So this is about pseudohemolytic type of reaction. Now in this image we can see a very diagrammatic representation of the pathogenesis of hemolytic transfusion reaction. So on the top of this image we can see that first incompatible red blood cells are binding with immunoglobulin M antibodies that were present in the blood of the recipient. Sometimes immunoglobulin G antibodies also play a role here. So what is happening after the incompatible red blood cell is binding with the antibodies? There is activation of complement system. And particularly important is complement 5 to complement 9. They will form membrane attack complex that will result in destruction of the red blood cell membrane. So there will be hemolysis and since this is happening inside the blood vessel, so we can also call this intravascular hemolysis. And at the same time, there will be also activation of other complements, for example, complement 3A, complement 5A, and they will result in hypertension and acute renal failure. Now, when there is intravascular hemolysis, the red blood cells are getting broken down inside the blood vessel. So, there will be elevation of hemoglobin inside the blood because recall that hemoglobin is found inside the red blood cells. And since now the red blood cells have been destroyed, so the hemoglobin that was inside the red blood cell will now come out of the blood cells and they will be seen in the blood. So there will be hemoglobin amia, presence of hemoglobin in the blood. Similarly, there will be hemoglobin urea, presence of hemoglobin in the urine, and there will be also methemoglobinemia. Now, intravascular hemolysis will also result in release of certain procoagulant material, particularly from the red blood cells stroma, and they will activate coagulation system and ultimately result in disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now I have a separate video entirely on disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC and you can also watch that video after finishing this video for more information. So this was in short regarding the pathogenesis of hemolytic transfusion reaction and this is very important for your written examination. So what are the clinical features of hemolytic transfusion reaction? Signs and symptoms usually appear within minutes of starting transfusion. They will include pain or heat sensation at the site of infusion, substernal pain, loin or back pain, restlessness, fever, rigors, breathlessness, tachycardia that is increased heart rate, hypertension, and bleeding manifestation. How can we diagnose hemolytic transfusion reaction? We can diagnose this by demonstration of intravascular hemolysis in the recipient and also by demonstration of ABO incompatibility between the recipient and the donor. So first, let's talk about diagnosis of intravascular hemolysis. So this is based on presence of these following findings in the recipient's post-transfusion blood sample. So there will be pink coloration of the plasma, spherocyte and fragmented red cells will be seen, there will be hemoglobinuria. We have already mentioned why there will be hemoglobinemia and hemoglobinuria. 
there will be elevated level of indirect serum bilirubin in the blood and there will be decreased level of haptoglobin in the blood. How can we demonstrate blood group incompatibility? We have to repeat ABO blood grouping and RH typing on both pre and post transfusion blood sample of recipient and also on donor blood unit. We have to repeat cross matching and all these things will demonstrate whether there were blood group incompatibility or not. Direct antiglobulin test or DAT on recipients pre-transfusion and post-transfusion blood samples are also helpful in demonstrating blood group incompatibility. How can we manage this condition? We have to stop the transfusion immediately. We have to maintain intravenous access with normal saline and we have to manage hypertension, renal failure and DIC. The next complication that we will talk about is allergic reaction. It may develop within minutes of initiating the transfusion. It occurs due to reaction between some plasma proteins of the donor and corresponding immunoglobulin E antibodies in the plasma of the recipient. The clinical features will include mild art carrier, rash and pruritus or itching. How can we manage this type of reaction? We have to slow the rate of transfusion and we also have to administer antihistamine. The next complication is anaphylactic reactions. These are characterized by hypertension, shock and breathlessness. However, there is no fever. These are rare. These may occur within minutes of starting the transfusion. Severe anaphylaxis may occur in individuals with immunoglobulin A deficiency. How can we manage anaphylactic reaction? The transfusion must be stopped immediately and we have to administer adrenaline and hydrocortisone. The next complication that we will talk about is transfusion associated lung injury or trally. This is very important both for your examination and also for your clinical skills. So transfusion associated lung injury or trally is characterized by fever, chills, dry cough and respiratory distress. This may occur within 1 to 4 hours of starting the transfusion. In x-ray there will be diffuse pulmonary infiltrates and donors are usually multiparous women who developed leukoagglutinins during pregnancy. And we will talk more about this in the pathogenesis section. So here, moving on to the pathogenesis of transfusion associated lung injury, we can see that the main reason is leukoagglutinins. Potent leukoagglutinins of donor blood reacts with incompatible granulocyte in the recipient's blood. So there will be formation of leukocyte aggregates. They will large in the pulmonary circulation and ultimately they will increase vascular permeability. The next topic that we will talk about is circulatory overload. The causes will include rapid rate of transfusion, excessive transfusion and if there is some impairment of cardiac or renal function. Treatment will include propping up the patient in sitting position, oxygen therapy and intravenous diuretics. The next complication is bacterial contamination. It is happening due to incomplete sterilization of skin during blood collection. It may also happen in asymptomatic bacteremia in the donor during the time of blood collection. Now, what do we mean by this term asymptomatic bacteremia? It means there is presence of bacteria in the donor blood. So that's why it is bacteremia. However, 
the donor is not showing any sign symptom. So that is known as asymptomatic bacteremia and if we take blood from the donor during that time there is risk of bacterial contamination. Other causes will include tiny breaks in the plastic blood bag and bacterial contamination may also happen when thawing of cryoprecipitate or fresh frozen plasma is done in a water bath. So now that we have talked about the immediate adverse effects of blood transfusion, now we will move on and talk about the delayed complications or delayed adverse effects of blood transfusion. So first let's talk about delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. It occurs in individuals who have been previously sensitized to certain red cell antigens due to pregnancy or due to previous transfusion. However, before the subsequent transfusion, the concentration of those antibodies are very low. So they are not detected by tests done in the recipient prior to transfusion. On re-exposure to the same red blood cell antigen during the subsequent transfusion, there is secondary immune response in the recipient and that will result in predominantly extravascular hemolysis. Clinical features that will be seen 5 to 10 days after transfusion will include fever, anemia and jaundice. The direct antiglobulin test will be positive. Moving on to the next complication and that is post-transfusion purpura. It can rarely develop about 5 to 10 days after transfusion in some adult multiparous woman. And it is happening due to previous sensitization of the recipient to a platelet antigen called HPA1A. And usually this type of sensitization occurs during pregnancy. After re-exposure to the same antigen through transfusion, the antibodies will paradoxically destroy the patient's own platelets that were HPA1A negative. Treatment will include plasma exchange and intravenous immunoglobulins. Now the next complication is very important and it is graft versus host disease. Causes will include blood transfusion in immunodeficient individuals and blood transfusion from first degree relative in immunocompetent individuals. So let's talk about the pathogenesis of graft versus host disease as you can see viable CD8 positive T lymphocytes of the donor will proliferate and attack recipients bone marrow cells and also possibly other organs and at the same time recipients immune system does not attack these donor T cells. Why? Because either the recipient is immunocompromised or the blood is taken from first degree relative, so there is some match between the HLA typing and that's why the recipient's immune system is not attacking those T lymphocytes of the donor. On the contrary, those T lymphocytes of the donor are proliferating and attacking the recipient's bone marrow. So there will be severe bone marrow suppression and pancytopenia as we will later see. Now what do we mean by pancytopenia? It is a condition where there is reduced level of red blood cell, white blood cells and platelet in the blood and bone marrow suppression is a very important cause of pancytopenia. So clinical features will be seen after 10 to 12 days of transfusion and they will include fever, skin rash, vomiting, diarrhea, pancytopenia, hepatitis, etc.
how can we prevent graft versus host disease one way is to irradiate the blood before transfusion and irradiation of blood will destroy the white blood cells and there will be no white blood cells left to show this type of reaction the next complication that we will talk about is iron overload always remember one unit of blood contains about 200 milligram of iron and daily physiologic loss of iron is about one milligram so that's why patients who are receiving regular long-term blood transfusion therapy they will inevitably develop iron overload and excess iron may deposit in the liver heart endocrine glands and other organ and they may also cause failure of the affected organs iron chelating therapy with desferioxamine should be started in these patients early to reduce iron overload the next complication that we will talk about is complication associated with massive blood transfusion now what do we mean by massive blood transfusion it is replacement of patient's blood loss with transfusion of stored blood that is equivalent to total blood volume within 24 hours now we don't normally do massive blood transfusion however it may be required in emergency situation for example following some accident or in some obstetric complication it is associated with some complications they will include dilution of platelet and coagulation factor now why is that thing happening storage of blood at 2 to 6 degrees celsius for 48 hours will cause loss of platelet function and also loss of labile clotting factors like clotting factor 5 and clotting factor 8 so when massive blood transfusion is done we are transfusing blood that is having no platelet function and that is having no factor 5 or no factor 8 so this will lead to dilution of platelet and coagulation factor massive blood transfusion will also result in hyperkalemia or increased amount of potassium in the blood and that is happening because red blood cells after they are getting destroyed potassium is getting liberated from those red blood cells massive blood transfusion will also result in hypocalcemia because calcium will bind with the citrate that was present in the blood bag as anticoagulant massive blood transfusion may also result in hypothermia if cold blood was transfused that's why we should warm the blood properly before transfusing and all these things hyperkalemia hypocalcemia and hypothermia may also lead to cardiac arrhythmia microaggregates are formed gradually in stored blood so after massive blood transfusion these microaggregates can migrate to lungs and there they can cause adult respiratory distress syndrome how can we prevent the complications associated with massive blood transfusion for example how can we prevent cardiac arrest we have to maintain adequate perfusion we have to warm the blood carefully but at the same time we have to be sure that the blood is not overheated and we have to administer calcium gluconate you can see the dose 10 milliliter of 10 percent calcium gluconate solution per liter of blood after first two liters so all these things can prevent complications of messy blood transfusion the next complication that we will talk about is transmission of infectious organisms during blood transfusion as we can see certain viruses bacteria parasites and prions can be transmitted from the donor to the recipient during blood transfusion so what are the viruses that can be transmitted during blood transfusion they will include hepatitis virus particularly hepatitis b and c 
Human Immunodeficiency Virus or HIV-1 and 2, Cytomegalovirus, Human T-Cell Leukemia Virus, Human Parvovirus B19, etc. Among the bacteria that can be transmitted during blood transfusion, there are Treponema pallidum, Pseudomonas, Staphylococci, etc. Now always remember, Treponema pallidum is responsible for causing syphilis. Among the parasites, there are malaria parasites, Trypanosoma cruzi, and Toxoplasma gondii. Regarding prions, prion that was responsible for causing Creutzfeldt Jakob disease can be transmitted from the donor to the recipient during blood transfusion. So how can we prevent transmission of infectious organism during blood transfusion? The first thing that we have to do is we have to collect blood only from voluntary and non-remunerated donors. Now what do we mean by this term non-remunerated donors? These are donors who are donating blood voluntarily on humanitarian grounds and they are donating without expecting any financial reward or benefit from their donation. So we have to take blood or we have to collect blood from such voluntary non-remunerated donors. They are donating on humanitarian grounds or due to their sense of duty and responsibility towards the society and we have to exclude professional blood donors. Why? Why do we have to exclude professional blood donors? Because sometimes professional blood donors who are selling their blood, they may hide certain information or certain history so that they can sell their blood. The second way is to exclude high-risk donors, for example, drug abusers, sex workers, and homosexuals should be excluded from blood donation. And the next way to prevent is to follow standard criteria for blood donor selection. And the last bullet point is very important. All donated blood and blood products must be screened thoroughly with various screening tests. So these are the ways we can prevent transmission of infectious organism during blood transfusion. So this concludes our video on adverse effects of blood transfusion. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more information. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.